And uh, this session will be explaining, we, we have uh, some of the top uh, venture capital firms here in Silicon Valley that invest uh, uh, in, in Korea as well as in US and global opportunities. And uh, they will be discussing why the Korean market is attractive in itself to, to invest in. It, uh, the panel will be moderated by Perry and he'll introduce the other speakers. Good morning. Um, pleased to be moderating the Silicon Valley VC uh, Investing in Korea panel. Um, our entrance wasn't as smooth, uh, but our panel I think will be fantastic because I've known these gentlemen for a long time. Uh, we're one of the few Korean American investors uh, based in Silicon Valley um, investing uh, in Korea. So we have a lot of uh, interesting investments and lessons learned from that, so I expect the, 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 uh, the panel to be quite interesting. My name is Perry Ha, uh, Managing Director at DFC Athena. As you might have heard from Tim Draper early in the morning that uh, uh, DFC Athena is a member fund uh, of DFC Network uh, focused on Korea. So it is a U.S. Delaware-based fund, but we have offices in, in the U.S. and in Seoul investing in Korea. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'll be interacting as an investor here and there, but I'll be asking the questions mostly to the, uh, to, to the uh, distinguished panelists here. Uh, what I'd like to do is I have a set of about, set of about 10 questions, uh, and we can certainly open up uh, to the audience for the questions you may have. Uh, what I'd like to do is start uh, with uh, the panelists introducing some th themselves for about two minutes. So if that's okay, Han, you might want to start uh, introducing yourself, and then we'll go to uh, Taehee, then Eric, that order. Uh, sure. This, uh, I'm Han Kim from Altos Ventures. Um, we've, it's a Silicon Valley-based firm. Uh, we had been dedicating about 10 to 15 percent of our fund investing in Korea-based companies. Uh, and we have about 10 Korea-based investments to date. Our first investment was in 2006. Uh, and we actually uh, liked our experience so much that uh, we've recently dedicated about $50 million fund to be started just for Korea-based companies. So uh, that effort just started. So that's how much we like uh, Korea-based companies. And we only invest in um, mobile internet-based services and software companies. Hi, I'm uh, Tehi Nam. I'm one of the, uh, the partners of Storm Ventures, and uh, I, I focus on investing in uh, mobile and SaaS companies, uh, whether they're here in the uh, United States or also in Korea, um, and uh, uh, have found that investing in Korea to be uh, very, very good for us and uh, for our LPs as well. Hi, I'm Eric Kim with Maverick Capital. We're celebrating our 20th year in business, and hopefully we'll have many more. Um, we're a global for firm. We have offices in San Francisco, New York, London, Hong Kong, hopefully Korea someday. Um, we've done a, a few investments in Korea, but our history with investing in Korea, in particular the internet, goes back to investing in a lot of the company, the public companies, um, such as NHN, Taum, NCSoft, NeoWiz. And then over the years, in particular, we've gone earlier and earlier uh, and now do um, uh, series A, Series B um, investments in Korea as well. So. Thank you. Uh, as you can hear from their backgrounds, uh, they are based here. So they understand the Silicon Valley culture and the investment. And on top of that, they've been investing in Korea. So there's a, definitely a comparison. Uh, so let me start with the most insightful question. So what do you like about investing in Korea? Uh, be a little more specific. Uh, don't say, hey, we made, we made money, therefore, there are, therefore we like Korea. So. Uh, Maybe perhaps one of you, uh, all of you can pick one thing that you think uh, is interesting that you like about investing in Korea. I guess I'll start. Um, for me, I like investing in Korea because uh, uh, for two things. First of all, I find that Korean founders are extremely passionate and driven, and uh, that's uh, an important ingredient for success, whether it's a, a Silicon Valley startup or a Korean startup or anywhere, in fact. And then the second is, is that uh, since mobile is an area that I really focus on and Korea is so strong in mobile with uh, uh, Samsung, LG, KT, SKT, find that it, uh, many of the, 
the business model services or technologies in mobile coming out of Korea are actually in advance of the United States. I'm sure a lot of folks have heard these statistics before, but you know it's great infrastructure, 95% internet penetration, if not higher. Uh, great end market, right? $30 billion e-commerce market growing at double digits per year. Uh, fantastic talent, one of the greatest education systems in the world. And the fourth thing that, that we've been realizing more recently is that it's a great gateway to the rest of, of Asia and Southeast Asia. If you think about uh, Korea as a market itself, it's a huge market and I, I think it deserves in, uh, investment in and of itself, but it also has served for us a, as a gateway to other markets, in particular Southeast Asia, China, Japan as well. So for us, we're, we're really excited for those reasons. I think those are all the reasons, and, and as an investor, one thing we like is actually there isn't that much competition among uh, various VCs from here wanting to travel to Korea to find some good companies. I thought that was our secret. <laughs> <laughs> now the secret's out. Um, let me just add on one more thing. That is, uh, Han talked about comp uh, the competition with other VCs. Uh, Tehi talked about uh, the good, uh, good team members working very hard. Uh, the, the cost of building a company is far lower for those reasons. And then there isn't um, uh, this easy departure from one company to another. So there's uh, the, the team loyalty uh, built into the equation, which is a big deal. Uh, as you may know, in the Silicon Valley today, it's uh, quite a hard market. Uh, it's very hard to attract good talent at a uh, reasonable price. Uh, we've, you know, a lot of us have been in the business for a long time. We remember the bubble days in the uh, year 2000 or slightly before, where some engineers who otherwise won't be hired because they're not good enough were getting multiple offers. Um, I know all of you here are not that case, but uh, uh, the, the supply and demand of both labor and capital plays a big, big factor in whether you can build a good company or not. So now, um, so you talked about the good things, but you know, let's uh, open up the hood and say, you know, I, don't, I really don't like about this, investing in Korea. So what are they? Let's start with Eric. Um, so, so I think one thing that I find a little bit frustrating more, more recently is, is um, the notion of, of, of what entrepreneurship means. When I'm here in Silicon Valley, so we're, we're one of the, the partners for Y Combinator, where we invest in all their startups as part of the YC fund and we spend time with their startups over the three month incubation period. It's very clear for each of those companies, for most of them at least, that the, the why is very important. Like why do we exist? And, and this is ex extreme passion of theirs and, and it's very clear why they're in the business of being an entrepreneur today. You know, what, what, I, what I hope will eventually happen in Korea too is that um, the why becomes very clear for entrepreneurs. It's not just a, 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 a you know, a very romantic thing to become an entrepreneur. It's a very tough thing. But I, I find that recently it's just a very romantic notion to become an entrepreneur. And that, for me, is a little bit frustrating because I meet very talented people, very young, great, talented folks who, who are missing that piece, that why. And, and so, you know, that, that's been a little bit frustrating for me. Han? Oh, Peggy, go ahead. Oh. Uh, for me, the, uh, I see the main challenge of uh, investing in Korea, and the reason why it's hard for me to, let's say, invest uh, 20 times more in Korea right now is it has to do with exits. Is that in Korea, um, uh, when companies go public on COSDAQ, what we're seeing on average is companies going out at 40 to $80 million market cap. And so, let's say as a VC, you own 10% of the company, that means you know, the proceeds to you are four to $8 million. Whereas here, you know, I've got a company that just went public this year, you know, you can go out at, at a market cap of over a billion dollars. And so for the same ownership, you get significantly better returns here in the United States. And so then I was thinking about it, and then the question is, you know, why is the, ex the, the COSDAQ exit much lower than a NASDAQ exit? And I think it has to do with uh, the potential market size that the companies are facing. So a typical Korean startup, and there are exceptions in games and e-commerce, but with, without those areas in general, um, by just serving the Korean market is a relatively smaller uh, opportunity, and therefore you have a smaller exit. And, and so, uh, 
that's the, the challenge that I see is sort of investing uh, in, in is sort of, you know, you get dollar in, but you also want to get a fairly good dollar out. Hi. I, um, I, I guess my difficulty is somewhat related to Tehi's comment, uh, although I, I do have a slightly different opinion on the market size. The, I think a lot of times in Korea what I find is that there is a, maybe it's because of the exit environment, a lot of people are really pressing investors and the founders as well, pressing for a certain amount of profits when they get to about a $10 million level and 10 million, 20 million, you get three, four million dollars of profit and you're ready to go public because you know, going to IPO is a, is a big event and when you go public around that time, the typical IPO market valuation is around 40 to 60 million and you go out and you don't really invest in sort of the next opportunity and you're somewhat happy with making more profits and a lot of times I see companies venture into completely unrelated areas with the, with the profits. And, and I do think that's one of the reasons why market cap of a lot of these companies don't move up. Uh, and you know, the, so the challenge for us typically is when the companies start to get to, start producing profits and they're you know, getting to a 10, $20 million range is, really convincing the entrepreneur, hey, this isn't it. I mean, you are just barely getting started. Let's figure out a way to build a $100 million business, whether it's domestic, going overseas, whatever it is, let's figure out a plan. Let's not be in such a huge hurry to go public. Let's build a real company that you know, could be valued at much, much higher. And, and those take, it, it takes some convincing uh, uh, before they get up there. Um, let me just add one piece to uh, what these gentlemen have said. Uh, maybe this is both good and bad. Uh, the biggest culture that I noticed through investment in Korea is that uh, Koreans always talk about the word owner, uh, the, who's the owner of Samsung, or who's the owner of SK, KT. The same kind of concept uh, applies all the way through uh, some of the startups as well, we've noticed. So we, in the US, investors look at the CEOs as professional managers. If they work out, that's great. If not, we may have to uh, bring a new CEO. Uh, in Korea, it does, doesn't quite work that way, because if your owner goes, then the company goes. And that's the, uh, not only the view of that particular entrepreneur, but also the people around them, or that the owner's gone, so therefore the company's in shambles. So I think uh, once you understand that, uh, you can kind of figure out how to, how to invest in, in the first place, and then, Second of all, when something, some things go, go wrong, you can also take that into consideration and manage in a, uh, in a way that's actually beneficial uh, to you as well, that in which uh, we had a couple of those interesting cases. But now, uh, let me uh, go to the next question. Uh, as you can see from people here, and the pitches from Korean companies from Korea, a lot of Korean entrepreneurs want to come to the U.S. Um, uh, so how Maybe you talked about it a little bit, uh, but how do you view uh, the success factors for the Korean uh, entrepreneurs from Korea trying to enter the U.S. market, bigger market? Somebody want to start with that one? Well, I mean, I, the, to track back a little bit, um, I, I think a lot of the Korean companies lack, um, I'm generalizing it, but lack your typical marketing skills. And, and I think it's because in Korea, you just haven't had much opportunity to practice marketing skills. And, and so if, if you think about sort of how the population really is segmented in the US, it's very dispersed. So, and in Korea, it's a homogenous society where you got uh, like half of the population in basically top 25 cities. So about 25 million people of Korea live in top 25 cities in Korea compared to the same 25 million people living in top 25 cities in the US. And the density level difference is about 16x. So you got hundreds of millions of people now dispersed in the US. In, in Korea, because of that density, when 
certain service comes out and it's, it's somewhat unique, it just takes off through word of mouth. And, and I think that's the kind of thing that a lot of the Korean companies are used to, so they rely on PR, et cetera, and they come to the U.S., and U.S. is, it's, it's not a homogenous society, and the population is dispersed over a, a big, big geographic areas. Now you have to figure out how to segment that audience and how, what's the cheapest way to reach that audience. And it takes a lot of trial and error in terms of getting to your customers, whether it's the consumer deals or business deals. And it just, a lot of times, you just haven't had that kind of practice. So unless you figure out a way that you could compete effectively in, in sort of the different settings, I think it's hard. And so it, it, it's not impossible, but you have to be able to compete on sort of on the marketing and sales before you could come out and have a decent chance of success. Tehi, perhaps uh, you can talk about uh, your experience. Sure. One of your portfolio companies obviously have done very well entering the U.S. Sure. Uh, perhaps you can put that into the context and describe? Yes. yes. So I think uh, what Han said is absolutely true, which is, you know, uh, just going to market in the United States is very hard whether you're a Korean, new Korean startup or a new Silicon Valley startup. I mean, it's just, frankly, it's very hard, and, and that's what separates companies that succeed from those, those that fail, frank, from, from my perspective. And, and so I've um, uh, been working with, uh, uh, as uh, Perry said, uh, 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 with the Korean startups that we invest in and sort of get to know. And uh, one company invested in uh, uh, about nine years, eight years ago was uh, come to us and I've been on the board of come to us and when we first invested, it's a mobile game company, uh, revenues in the United States was about zero um, and then they sent one person to the United States and uh, uh, he ended up moving to, from LA to our office, spent a lot of time with him and uh, over the years, uh, uh, US now is I think 30% of the company's revenue, so it went from zero to about 30%, and the U.S. office is up to, uh, I think now about 10 people, uh, maybe eight or nine. And so, um, and then there are other Korean companies been working with uh, uh, trying to, you know, replicate the, uh, the U.S. go-to-market. So I, I think based on that experience, I think uh, uh, a couple of things, uh, advice I have is, uh, number one is, uh, it only works if the, the CEO is personally committed to making this successful. That's the first thing I would say, is that if the CEO doesn't have that level of commitment, and, and a, a good test of the commitment is, is that the person's willing to come to the United States at least once a quarter, um, I think it's just gonna be tough. You know, if you wanna delegate and all that, it's just, it's, it's a hard thing to, uh, uh, otherwise, unless you have that kind of personal commitment from the, the, C, the CEO side, and then the second is, is that uh, uh, the, the go-to-market, well, I find whether it's even a U.S. companies or Korean companies, that the go-to-market strategy has to fit the, the DNA of the company and the culture of the company rather than following a generic model. Because uh, it, it, it just, you just can't take someone else's strategy and say that's yours, because every person is different. But once that happens, it can uh, work out very well. In the interest, interest of time, I may go to the next question. Eric, I'll, go, I'll start with you. Um, uh, talk about the uh, difference in investment terms between what we're used to here in the U.S. and in Korea, and how do you deal with some of the fundamental differences? I, I um, remember a term sheet um, that we negotiated a few, a few years ago where uh, it was getting so complicated, and the lawyers in the U.S. and Korea were having such difficulties reconciling uh, typical U.S. terms, particularly around liquidation preferences and what that meant. Um, you know, most things, that, that, doesn't, that term doesn't, really doesn't exist in Korea. Um, so I had to basically get everyone in the room, the U.S. lawyers, the Korean lawyers, myself, and then the management of the company to walk people through what this meant. So it was a very long process to basically um, uh, make everyone understand why we would potentially put that kind of term in. So it, 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 there are, um, I've noticed it's gotten bet better though in the past few years, um, but it, there are some key differences, and this goes back to your owner 
statement earlier, Perry, I think, where, um, you know, if, if a CEO of a company owns a huge amount of the, uh, of, of the equity, um, they may not uh, appreciate some of the terms that investors may want to put in quite yet, so. So Han, what did you, um, how do you work with uh, the conflict in the liquidation preference terms uh, uh, that's, uh, well, liqu liquidation preference, preference terms that's in conflict with Korean uh, trade laws? Or do you uh, just let it go and say, all right, 1x, that's it? No, we, we, even in the U.S., we don't go more than 1x liquidation preference. Uh, for those of you who may not know what liquidation preference means, it's basically, let's say, uh, VCs like us, let's say we invest $3 million into the company and we take 10%. Uh, and, but the company gets sold for $5 million. That doesn't mean a 500K comes to the VCs. It means that $3 million plus, you know, whatever annual dividend rate that you put on comes to the VCs before, you know, whatever one point, you know, whatever million gets shared among the rest of the common uh, shareholders, including the management team. And a lot of the, I, I think, in, in Korea, that kind of practice is, is not something that's widely understood. So what we do is, during the process, uh, I actually got to know about this conflict more recently, but uh, what we do is we make sure this is all spelled out, and the, before any of the common shareholders actually get, make any money, we make sure that, uh, I, I think the way it gets done is, the money actually has to transfer over to the preferred investors um, uh, before the commons, common gets any proceeds. And on top of that, the, that includes all the, all the individual investors that may have invested in the company before as well. So that's sort of the agreement that we put in place. Anything specific, uh, Tehi? specific terms. What about the options? In Korea, you're not allowed to give options to the uh, founding team or the owner. Yeah, we just went through this, uh, uh, n not, not with respect to the founder or owner, uh, but uh, just a, a few months ago, where for a company, uh, you know, we want to go to the market in the United States, and so we had two people we really wanted to recruit. One is a retired, very senior executive at one of the major U.S. carriers, and the other is a, a vice president coming out of another major U.S. company, and uh, uh, giving them standard Silicon Valley options was not something that we could do. Like, for example, you couldn't exercise them for two years, and there are all these other requirements uh, under Korean law which made it unattractive in terms of recruiting top Silicon, you know, top U.S. talent. I'd add just one general statement about the differences between Korean law and U.S. law. And I'm not a lawyer, so I'm, I'm not a particular expert, but based on my experience, it, you know, it, when I see certain Korean term sheets, things are not really specific sometimes. And then when you, in, in a U.S. term sheet, it can be very specific, it can be like 10 pages long. And then, and if we bring that to a Korean entrepreneur, they'll be like, well, why? There'll be some suspicion of distrust, why are there so many specific terms, and they'll push back a lot. And in the U.S., we're very used to things going to court or things going wrong or going to arbitration. And so the reason for the specificity is so that in those bad outcomes, we have clarity about what will happen. But when you bring those terms over to Korea, it's perceived as you're being suspicious. Why are you trying to put all these specific terms in? Can't you just trust me? Blah, 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 blah. But from our perspective, it's so that we don't have huge problems down the road if something were bad were to go on, so that there's clarity. You know, we value clarity so much. So I think that's been uh, just a general meta observation that I've had in dealing between the two. I guess that's why Koreans go drink, <coughs> to resolve these conflicts. <laughs> right, go drink, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, what about uh, the government's uh, involvement or the support uh, into entrepreneurship and, the, and startups, even some, some of the v, uh, VC, uh, or taking position um, in the VC funds as an LP. 
uh, for example, even today's conference, I think, is in part supported by the Korean government, especially with the new administration, uh, really want to support entrepreneurship, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there are a lot of grants and a lot of programs that the Korean startups uh, can go pitch for and get the grants. Uh, how do those things uh, work? Uh, how do they think, do they actually help or do they actually hurt? Is that a more distraction? What, what uh, have been your experiences? Anybody want to take it? I, I, you know, the way I think about it, I think it's net positive. I don't know if it's going to make a huge difference. Uh, I, I do think if whoever is behind whatever the government program it is, if it's a government person, if he or she actually takes responsibility for it, for whatever the, the results may be, then I think it's, it could be very attractive. If that person is doing that so that he or she gets promoted and then the person moves on after a year or two and don't take responsibility for it, then I think it's, it's probably not going to have a good outcome. I think it's actually fantastic in sort of getting uh, the entrepreneurship system uh, 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 geared up in Korea. I mean, to make entrepreneurship sort of a cool thing, you know, socially acceptable, provide initial funding, uh, and a lot of other support. And I think the, the challenge, though, is, is, that, uh, um, is how to make it so that it's repeatable and sustainable without Korean government support or any government support. Because uh, uh, you know, I think Korea did the same thing in the in sometime in the 90s, and you had this sort of surge, and it, uh, uh, it turned out not to be sustainable. Um, but so that that would be my thought: is whether it's in Korea or any place that uh, government is a good way of starting, but it has to be sustainable without the government support forever. Um, I believe we have about five minutes left. Uh, what I'd like to do is perhaps uh, now turn the table around and say. Uh, there are a lot of Korean, Koreans in Korea try to build a business and try to enter the U.S. But there are also a lot of Korean Americans in the U.S. Uh, because of the heritage network whatnot, want to do something connected to Korea as well. Uh, so uh, from your experience, I'm sure you see a lot of Korean Americans who uh, come through your doors uh, pitching the story and I'm doing this, this, and this. Um, what are the opportunities and what would be your advice to, uh, to each one of those? So all three of you could take uh, maybe a one minute shot each and then or perhaps we might have to close. Okay, let's start with Eric. Uh, so as a Korean American, I'm a full supporter of Korean Americans uh, trying to uh, go back to Korea and, and, um, and be part of the ecosystem. My, my first job out of college was actually going to Korea to work at a startup. Um, and you know my language skills were not that great. When uh, going there, I learned a lot, uh, both language and how to do business there. But I, I, I just felt this personal passion to go over and, and, and get in touch with your roots and, and be part of the ecosystem. And that was a, a while ago. And now you fast forward to 2013 today, there are so many more opportunities to do that. So for Korean Americans, I think it's a great opportunity to go do that. Also, it's as much about bringing what you may have learned here, some best practices. Not everything's gonna fit, but taking that over, going to Korea, being able to potentially contribute in a little different way, both your language skills and bring port porting over some of the best practices from over here. So I, I highly encourage it, I highly encourage it. Yeah, like Eric, I think you know, it's a phenomenal opportunity, uh, especially with the rise of Korea, uh, whether uh, it's in IT or K-pop or content, whatever. And uh, my suggestion to Korean Americans is from a career standpoint is to uh, pick a, a sector where uh, both Korea and the United States are strong in. So then you, you can then have the advantage of a network and skills on both sides that will advance your career wherever you may be because you may be going back and forth. Yeah, I mean, I, same here. I would absolutely encourage it. I, you know, the, when you think about it, Korea is a place where you could quickly gain traction. You know, I talked about sort of the, um, the lack of, you know, the marketing expertise in Korea. However, Korea is one of those countries where you could gain millions of users very quickly with the right product and the right service. Uh, just and it's probably the cheapest customer acquisition in terms of you know when you when you really count 
the user acquisition cost numbers. And it's a place where you could get to a one to two million very quickly and expand from there. And, and, and if you could take these, some of the expertise that you learned from here and go, I, it's a fantastic uh, opportunity. We've had, you know, one of the companies Eric and I are involved in, Kupang is a, a Korean American, went over there with zero ties to Korea. It's grown to be a fantastic company. Um, and, you know, I'm sure th there will be many more opportunities like that. That's great. Um, uh, let's see, one last parting thought as a moderator and then perhaps uh, also as an investor would be uh, related to their concept. I think there's a lot of opportunities for being Korean American and be able to leverage the heritage, heritage uh, plus all the, the rise of IT economy in Korea uh, so that uh, you can take into uh, those into consideration and uh, hopefully build a good company by becoming an entrepreneur. That said, I think we, we're all living in the Silicon Valley, which is actually a huge bubble. So I think uh, having uh, the word passion is overstated uh, and uh, overemphasized, and uh, oftentimes uh, understanding oneself is quite important as well. So uh, not everyone's going to start a company become Mark Zuckerberg in five years or two years. Uh, so I think uh, uh, building fundamental uh, uh, business skills, uh, technical skills, marketing skills, and gaining the experience before jumping in, I think, would be very important. Make sure to balance those two as opposed to being caught up by this blind passion. Passion is absolutely needed, but I think you also have to put in hard work uh, and get the experience and build it up. Uh, so that would be my last thought. Anyway, uh, uh, please, uh, please give a big round of applause for these fantastic panelists. Thank you very much.